Um, today we have a fairly light agenda, so uh, we can get through that, and if folks need to check out uh, before the next meeting at 9 o'clock, that's probably a good strategy. Uh, first on the agenda would be the approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any uh, changes to the agenda? Seeing none, agenda is accepted. Um, next, the proceedings from the last board meeting, May 2018. Are there any requested changes or amendments to that document? Seeing none, I'll deem it accepted. Next public comment. Uh, has anyone signed up for public comment? Do you know, Caitlin? No. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak on any issues that are not before the board today? I don't see anyone, so we'll move on to our first substantive uh, order of business, which is to review the technical committee report on biological sampling requirements. And that'll be done by Linda Barry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Last year, the TOTOG Technical Committee was tasked to evaluate the biological sampling requirements. This was at the request of the plan review team due to several states falling short of the minimum sampling requirements during the last few years. Uh, these, uh, there were issues obtaining the samples, um, including uh, the TOTOG not being encountered in their traditional sampling methods. Uh, much of the, uh, the commercial harvest goes to the live market. And, uh, um, there's a developing market for the racks, the, what's left over of the fish after the fillets have been taken. And uh, they're being sold for bait and also for human consumption as a, a base for soup stock. And then some states were also having uh, um, issues with uh, fishermen who uh, were reluctant to uh, um, participate in the sampling program because of their frustrations of uh, uh, what they viewed as management measures that uh, were continually eating away at their ability to harvest. And, Getting these uh, uh, age length uh, data is really, really critical for uh, this stock because uh, um, the stock assessment process for TOTOG is based on age structured models. So the annual biological sampling requirement was uh, implemented with Addendum 3 in 2002. It required all states to collect data to support coastwide stock assessment until the, the body of data and the analytical results were sufficient for regional sampling approaches, uh, regional assessment approaches. Um, it specified that each state had to collect a minimum of 200 days in length samples. Uh, this was based on the rationale that you, you get five fish per centimeter um, within a range of sizes that are commonly caught, not necessarily harvested, but caught by the fishermen. So here you have the, uh, a portion of the uh, um, age length key from New Jersey's uh, TOTOG uh, samples from 2015. And what you have here on the top are the, uh, the ages and then along the side are the, uh, the lengths. And where I've highlighted it, you can see that there's quite a lot of overlap in the ages and lengths. And so if you go with the five fish per centimeter length, you can very well see that each one of those five fish would be a different age. So again, there is this wide overlap of ages and lengths as the, uh, the fish uh, grows older and larger. <clears throat> uh, Tiffany Vidal Cunningham from uh, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries uh, performed a sample size analysis uh, using the uh, uh, TOTOG samples that were obtained in 2016 from three of their surveys, uh, the trawl survey, the ventless trap survey, and they have a pilot rod and reel survey. And you can see from the, uh, the numbers um, that, uh, of the, uh, the tow tog that they obtained that uh, she had a sample size of uh, nearly 600 fish. And so she performed an analysis to determine the sample sizes uh, required to, set, uh, to obtain the certain levels of precision um, around the, uh, the length of age estimates. And so on the left-hand side, you see the, uh, the results from her analysis. Um, within the you know, different age categories, you have the sample sizes that are necessary to achieve a precision of either having a CV of uh, 0.25 or 0.1. The negative values in uh, the, the sample sizes um, just uh, indicate that you know, extremely large sample sizes would be needed. 
So I highlighted uh, where you did have um, one age category with a uh, um, uh, precision level with the CV of 0 0.25, where you could actually get by without getting the, the full 200 samples. And then the ages on either side, you still needed at least 200 samples, but it was just a slightly over that. But then you look at all the other uh, sample sizes, and they are much higher than 200. And basically what the analysis showed us was that um, in order to really uh, achieve a, um, the uh, level of precision for all the age categories, you really can't go below 200. So the TC also looked at the, uh, uh, at the level that the sampling requirements should be applied, whether it should be at a regional level or at a state level. The advantages for going with a regional level would be that it would align with the regional stock structure of the stock assessment. And it would also potentially alleviate the sample shortage problems that some of the states were having. The disadvantages included that uh, it would potentially reduce the, uh, the quantity of the samples that were be obtained overall. And that could negatively impact stock assessment if the, uh, some states are consistently undersampled. So the TC concluded that uh, we should maintain the state level requirements. This ensures that there's adequate sample numbers throughout the whole management region. Um, the state samples will continue to be pooled uh, in order to uh, develop regional age length keys. And states should document their sampling efforts, especially if they're falling short. So that way then they could show that there's a good faith effort to comply with the requirements. The TC also agreed that the minimum uh, sample size of 200 uh, samples should be maintained um, due to the wide overlap of ages and lengths as the, uh, the TOTOG ages. Uh, the sample size analysis showing that the precision of the uh, length and age estimates would definitely suffer if the sample sizes went below 200. And the sample size reductions also might lead to a widening of uh, data gaps that we have on our, our length distributions. Um, the TC felt that these uh, data gaps should probably be addressed with maybe more use of uh, uh, fisheries independent samples um, or possibly the use of uh, uh, non-lethal methods with sampling. And if regions turned out to be consistently undersampled, we would have to again revisit and reevaluate the uh, sampling requirements. So through this process, we did bring up the possibility of using pelvic fin spines as a, another aging structure. Um, the recent studies have shown that the, uh, you could get fairly precise the age estimates using this structure. And it's a non-lethal sampling method, so that way it would uh, open up the ability to sample fish that are headed for the live market or for the whole fish market, because it won't be disfiguring them enough to um, affect their marketability. And uh, it would also allay some of the concerns that were expressed about um, sacrificing fish from a population that the, the stock status uh, indicates that it's in need of recovery. Um, and then it would also allow uh, states uh, that were having problems obtaining the minimum number of samples to uh, get to that, uh, at least that minimum number. So the, the the TC is generally supportive about uh, the idea of using the pelvic fin spines, but before the TC could uh, approve it as an alternate uh, aging uh, structure, there would need to be a full evaluation of the age information to ensure that uh, the age uh, estimates that you read from these structures would be compatible with what we've been reading with the opercula and the otoliths. Um, so, this would involve collecting paired samples of the pelvic fin spines or either opercular or otoliths, and then doing comparison studies to make sure that the age estimates are the same or uh, co comparable. Um, if we had positive results from this comparison study, then the, we would perform uh, paired aging uh, exchange with the other states. Uh, although some states did have concerns that they might not have the, uh, the budgeting or the staff to be able to uh, participate fully in this process. Uh, the TC is willing to currently consider collecting uh, the paired uh, samples um, and then doing some uh, comparison studies. Um, 
TC could consider supplementing the age samples um, uh, if the collection, the preferred structure was really, really limited. And uh, however, the TC would not want to use the data from the, the pelvic fin spines until, for assessment purposes, until after the TC has gone through the process of, of evaluating it and then approving it. Um, so the first step, uh, the TC would like to, um, would be for the, the states to determine their ability and their interest in participating in this type of paired sample exchange. So in a, to wrap this up, um, the recommendations from the uh, TC to the management board are to maintain the state level biological sampling requirements, maintain the minimum number of 200 age and length samples per state per year, and to ask the states to determine their ability and the interest level to participate in a um, further study of the pelvic fin spines with the uh, goal of having a paired exchange of the um, aging structures uh, with the other states. And with that, I'd uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Linda. That was a great presentation. Um, any questions for Linda? John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Linda. With the pelvic spines, how much uh, preparation is involved in that? I know the opercles take some work to get ready. Are the spines thin sectioned? Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I'm not as familiar with the other um, preparation of the pelvic fine, fin uh, spine structures, but the, um, uh, from, you would have to section them. Um, so there would be some uh, preparation involved, but uh, it wouldn't be as I don't imagine it to be as time consuming and as laborious as the uh, opercula because with opercula you have to boil it and then you know go through the whole letting it dry for a certain amount of time. Um, there would have to be a little bit of I guess some training involved to make sure that the uh, whoever's reading the, uh, the the spines would know exactly where to start counting the uh, the annuli. Another question from Jay McNamee and then Justin and Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice job, Lindy. Uh, thank you for that report. Um, I just wanted to, to make a couple of quick comments. So I, I support the recommendations of the technical committee. Um, I think the challenge with the age length keys is always not in the kind of heart of the distribution, but in the tail. So, you know, that shooting for that goal of 200, the idea is that you hope you get some little ones and some really big ones. but. Um, you know, I, I think maintaining it's it's worked. I don't know. Okay, I guess I'll say over the years. Um, so I think it's still a good goal to shoot for. Um, I do think, though, it would be good to have a discussion with the technical committee to, you know, also remind them that the the idea is to get a full characterization of the length distribution. So if you can get some smaller guys and some bigger guys that's uh, a good thing to do and then quickly on the um, pelvic spines I, I think that's a great idea we should try and do that and so I guess my question is is this going to the logistics part of that is that going to be a discussion with the technical committee um, I, I'm guessing there will be a couple of states that would be interested we get the full racks in Rhode Island so we could get both structures um, and maybe there are some states that have some capacity where if some of the states can't manage um, processing or maybe they could process them and not age them, maybe some of the other states could help out. So I, I think that would be a good discussion to have with the technical committee to kind of figure out those logistics because I, I think this would be, that's a challenge with TATOG. A lot of it goes to, to the live market. So anything we can do to get age structures, not kill the fish, would be uh, a benefit. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that presentation. I, I really appreciate the degree to which the technical committee took a thorough look at this. We're one of those states where at times we've struggled to come up with those 200 samples, and I know there's been discussions amongst our staff of do we really need to collect 200 samples, and so I think this provides some really good, you know, sort of justification for keeping that high sampling level. Uh, my thoughts were along the same line of Jay's that looking at that age length key, 
you know, those 52 centimeter, 20 inch fish at ages from seven to 17, that that may be an area where we really need, you know, to get a lot of samples to really parse out the age structure in those size categories. So I'm wondering if, you know, the TC considered making a recommendation to states to prioritize collection of structures from older, or larger fish. Uh, you know, that general recommendation of five per centimeter category will probably lend itself to getting a whole bunch of samples right in the middle there and not so much on the tails. Uh, and I also wanted to make the comment that for a couple of years now, Connecticut has been collecting paired samples, opercula and the, and the pelvic spines, but we haven't been able to process the pelvic spines due to lack of staff and time. So along uh, the lines of what Jay was saying, if some states, you know, want to undertake one of these paired studies and process some structures, Connecticut has some that we'd probably be willing to put in the mail and, and send to somebody if they want to take a look at them. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, um, the suggestion about uh, uh, possibly yeah with you know some states they you know might not be able to fully um, process and go the whole you know pro uh, from collecting through comparison studies, but if they could at least collect the spines, and then if the other states that you know have the capacity and the um, the skill to be able to then um, go through you know processing them, reading them, and 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 then doing the uh, comparison studies, I I think that would make it a whole lot easier and a whole lot more acceptable to the you know the, the general group. So thank you, Joe Semino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to <coughs> thank Lindy and the, the the TC for the work here. I. I, I appreciate the, um, I guess, the conservative approach both to staying status quo um, and I guess it's on the board to kind of uh, understand that good faith attempt at, at, at achieving these goals and as we have with other boards just, um, you know, not, not turn that into a compliance issue. Um, if it sounds like if, if the spines, one of the values is uh, they're able to sample live fish, um, then my assumption would be that some of these states that are struggling are able to at least get lengths off of these fish. So I, it sounded like the TC had a recommendation that um, fisheries independent sampling could be used, and I would just want to throw some support towards that too if, if needed for samples as long as we're seeing uh, the ability to get lengths from the, from the actual fisheries. And I, I also appreciate the uh, slow approach to uh, looking into the spines because I think at some point ASMFC would, would need to put forward uh, some money towards a, a workshop or something along those lines. And I think the, the work going into this this, this year, uh, as states are looking into what they can do, uh, will give us time to see what we need to do in the future. So I just want to thank you guys. Thank you, Joe. Um, Linda, I have a question. Um, the recommendation from the TC was to have states communicate about their interest and willingness to participate. Does that need a deadline? Uh, we haven't set a deadline uh, as of yet, um, although it could be something that we start to discuss in the new year. Thank you. All right, so um, there, aren't, there isn't any um, action items on this because we're not changing the, um, the plan mandates for the minimum number of samples. So I guess we can move on. All right, next on the agenda is a discussion of the commercial harvest tagging program implementation. And Caitlin, I think you'll start this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'll be providing an overview of the draft implementation guidelines for the commercial tagging program. And in my presentation, I'll cover some background information on the tagging program and then go over the contents of the document that was provided in materials, which includes sections on each of these aspects of the tagging program listed on the slide. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about a prospective timeline for implementation. So under Amendment 1, um, approved in October 2017, a commercial harvest tagging program was required for TATOG to com combat um, illegal and unreported harvest. And specifically, the requirements as described in the amendment include uniform single-use tags with unique identifiers be applied to TATOG by the harvester before offloading, um, that the number of tags allocated to harvesters would be determined by the state based on a biological metric that unused tags um, should be returned to the state 
agency that issued them no later than February 15th of the next year, and then that each state must submit an annual compliance um, report, including an annual commercial tag report. And that would have information on the tags issued and used, um, as well as participating harvesters and reporting um, commercial harvest. The amendment also required that this program be implemented by January 2019, which I'll come back to at the end of the presentation. Um, so building on the requirements in Amendment 1 and drawing from some other tagging program regulations, I worked with the board chair, the LEC, and the TC to develop some draft guidelines for implementation of the commercial harvest tagging program. And these draft guidelines are intended to provide some more direction to the states in constructing their regulations and administering the program um, in order to encourage consistency and compatibility between state programs as well as enhance and law enforcement's ability to monitor compliance with the program across the management unit. Um, the document recommends procedures for all aspects of the tagging program, and it's meant to just help avoid loopholes and ensure its effectiveness when it's implemented. Um, so the first section of the draft guidelines provides recommendations for a tag distribution and to avoid confusion and reduce the opportunities for unauthorized individuals to obtain tags, it's recommended that each state's management agency acquire tags from the manufacturer directly and then distribute those to their authorized harvesters. The LEC and TC agree that accounting and reporting would be made a lot easier if harvesters were issued tags with consecutive numbers, um, and the states would need to determine ahead of time what total number of tags they would order and the number that they would allot to each harvester based on a biological metric like the prior year's harvest um, in numbers of fish plus an additional amount of tags as a buffer. And tags should not be transferable and regulations should prohibit reusing, altering, and counterfeiting tags. Regarding tag application, the LEC recommended adding language to um, the Amendment 1's requirements to specify that all fish would need to be tagged prior to offloading or before carring the vessel to ensure that there aren't any um, untagged fish remaining on vessels without an authorized harvester on board. Um, it's also recommended that tags be applied consistently to one side, um, the operculum on one side of the fish, and which side that is should be determined through discussions with the TC to make sure that there isn't any conflict with their biological sampling. Um, and again, application of tags in sequential order would simplify accounting and reporting, and there should be a requirement for tags to remain on the fish until final sale. Um, states should also take measures to ensure that tags are not being applied during closures in the middle of seasons. So the amendment uh, requires that any unused tags be returned to the harvester, uh, or sorry, to the state agency by the harvester um, no later than February 15th of the following year. And the LEC recommended adding some language to say, or within 90 days of the end of the fishing season, whichever is sooner, in order to reduce the gap between the end of seasons that end a little earlier in the year and the end of the fishing season, um, the final end. So it's also recommended that the states require tags to be returned prior to renewing harvesters' permits. Um, and in reporting to the state, harvesters should include information on tags that were lost or broken, as well as those that were applied to fish. And this information should also then be included in the annual tag report from the state. States should also implement tag expiration dates such that um, it would be illegal for any harvester to sell fish with expired tags to a buyer or dealer, but that dealers in possession of fish with expired tags could still sell them to the final consumer. Um, and it's recommended that tags expire at the end of the fishing year. The last sections of the document discuss um, penalties and outreach about the tagging program, and each state will need to determine what their penalties are for violating tagging program requirements, but they could include um, suspension of permits or licenses, confiscation of all fish that were caught, possessed, or sold in violation of the program, seizure and forfeiture of property used in violation, as well as fines. Um, and finally, to promote compliance, the state should also include some aspects of outreach in their implementation of the program to make sure that all levels of the supply chain are knowledgeable about the requirements of the program. 
So as I mentioned earlier, the implementation of the tagging program was originally required by January of 2019. However, um, as most of you know, we've run into some issues with obtaining an effective applicator from the tag manufacturer that we were working with, and we're still trying to source a reliable alternative. Um, additionally, many of the states have lengthy regulatory processes, so starting this late in the year, um, they would not likely be able to implement final regulations by January. So therefore, if the board is in agreement, um, the tagging or the date of implementation for the tagging program could be rescheduled to January 2020. And in 2019, we can use that time as a trial period for the states that are able to do that. So that concludes my presentation and I can take any questions. Any questions for Caitlin? Well, just a comment from me. Um, it, it looks like this guidance document gives jurisdictions a fair amount of uh, flexibility, which is good. Um, I'll forecast that it, this will become a perennial topic for the Law Enforcement Committee as states sort of compare and contrast how to make this work. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, refinement as it goes forward. So uh, no questions for Caitlin at this time? Okay, uh, Caitlin has another comment. I just wanted to add that um, if you have a chance to read through the draft guidelines and have any recommendations for how to improve them, or as Dan said, um, you know, find ways to hone down some of that flexibility where possible to make sure programs are compatible with each other across the states, that would be wonderful, and I'd love to hear your feedback. So, Caitlin, some of the uh, one question, some of the details in here. Um, could they be used in a, uh, in a non-compliance determination or so how, how do you foresee that going forward? Um, I think the, um, the requirements as listed in Amendment 1 would be right now the basis for a non-compliance finding. Um, however, I think it would be up to the board if, if there's a desire to create some stricter language. Um, I would see that as something the board could decide to do. And would that be done with an addendum? Yes. Thank you. Just John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, it's on the agenda as an action item. Do we need to have a motion to postpone until 2020? Executive Director Beal recommends that. So yes, would you make that motion? Yes, I will make that motion. Move to postpone implementation until 2020. Is it January 2020? Or January 2020. Is there a second? Um, Justin? Is there any objections to the motion? If not, it, it passes by unanimous consent. All right. Um, I guess the next is the um, approval of the fisheries management plan review and state compliance reports. Caitlin? That'll actually be Jess. Jess. Good morning. I'll be presenting on the Tatag FMP review for the 2017 fishing year. I'll start with changes to management, then landings trends, biological sampling, and end with compliance and de minimis requests. There were no changes to the federal commercial or recreational measures from the 2016 to the 2017 fishing year. The measures remained a 14 inch minimum size limit, inclusion of degradable fasteners on one panel or door in pots and traps, and state specific management programs to achieve the target fishing mortality. <coughs> state recreational and commercial regulations are summarized on pages 21 and 22 of the FMP review document. The board also approved amendment one to the Tatog FMP for implementation in April 2018. This graph shows trends in commercial and recreational landings from 1981 to 2017. Coastwide commercial landings increased by 7.3% from 2016, from 283,906 pounds in 2016 to 304,600 pounds in 2017. This is the highest value for commercial landings since 2008, when 310,940,000 pounds were landed. Recreational harvest decreased by 34% from 2016 to 2017 with totals of 2.7 and 1.8 million pounds in each year, respectively. The 2017 recreational landings were the lowest recreational landings for Tatog, 
since 2011, when 1.5 million pounds were landed. Recreational harvest has consistently made up about 90% of total coastwide landings each year, with commercial landings accounting for the other 10%. In 2017, the trend continued, with recreational harvest making up about 85% of total landings. Connecticut, New York, and Delaware were unable to meet the 200 age sample requirement in 2017. Connecticut's shortage of samples was due to a lack of tatog caught in the Long Island Sound Survey and funding and staff limitations that prevented additional sampling. New York was limited in collecting samples for both the recreational and commercial fisheries due to several issues, including weather, recreational fishing crews unwilling to give them racks for aging because they were using them as bait and because the majority of commercially caught tatog was going to the live market and was therefore not available for collecting age samples. Delaware was unable to collect the required number of samples due to issues with requiring recreational samples. Difficulties with acquiring the required number of samples has been an issue for a number of states for the past several years and the compliance report showed that these states all made a good faith effort to get their number, minimum number of samples. The PRT still recommends the board find all states in compliance with the sampling requirements of the FMP. Delaware and Maryland requested and qualify for continued de minimis status. The PRT recommends that the board approve the state's request. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? All right, seeing none, um, I think we need a motion to accept the report, including the de minimis request. David Borden. Yeah, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Staff prepared the motion for me. Uh, I'd move to accept the FMP review and compliance reports for the 2017 <coughs> fishing year and approve de minimis status for Delaware and Maryland. Is there a second? Ray Kane. Any objection to the motion? Any? Abstentions, seeing none, motion is approved unanimously. All right, now we're into other business. Is there any other business to come before the board today? All right, seeing none, um, Bob, I think this is a good moment to be checking out of our rooms. Yeah, like since the southern states aren't here yet, um, I think we'll, we'll start the policy board at 9.15 as scheduled, and I think the rest of us can use this time to check out and get ready to roll when we're all done, if that works for everybody. So thank you.